Every new anime season brings a crop of new anime to watch. Some of those anime are refreshing and a joy to view, however some of those anime can be dull and a chore to suffer through. The anime seasons during 2016 were no exception. Guestimating that there are roughly 30 new anime that debut each season, and knowing that there are 4 seasons to a year, that would mean that there are at least 120 new anime that aired in 2016. That number does include sequels and spin-offs, but excludes any OVAs or movies. Looking at all the anime that aired last year, there are some pretty good ones. There are also a few anime that weren't so good, i.e. bad. But more than both of those, there are a lot of anime that were okay to decent. Of all the anime that aired last year, a handful of them featured video games or video game-like mechanics. And You Thought There Was Never a Girl Online heavily featured characters playing video games, and Konosuba has very video game-like mechanics, with it having a leveling system and its characters using skill points. However, what about the people who make the video games? The video game developers? What about their story? When will it be told? Well, it already has. If those video game developers happen to be cute girls. On this episode of Visor View, I'm going to take a look at three anime that aired in 2016 that featured girls, girls, girls making video games, games, games. My plan is to review these anime in order that they aired in 2016. So let's flip the calendar back to the winter 2016 anime season. When everyone was talking about and watching the mystery thriller Erased, and or laughing at the fantasy world comedy Konosuba, this drama romance about making a video game was also airing. I'm of course referring to Girls Beyond the Wasteland. When I saw the title Girls Beyond the Wasteland, my first thought was that it was going to be about girls and our young woman surviving in a post-apocalyptic wasteland of some sort. That was probably due to the fact that I had Fallout 4 on the brain since, at that time, it would have been out for a little over a month. While Girls Beyond the Wasteland doesn't feature a physical wasteland, it does feature a metaphorical one. That being the cruel and harsh wasteland that is Bishoujo video game development. More on that a little later. Girls Beyond the Wasteland is based on a visual novel developed by Minatosoft. If you're not familiar with visual novels, they're best described as sort of like a choose-your-own-adventure book, with multiple routes and endings, except with a lot more pictures and usually even subtle character animations. Though it should be mentioned that not all visual novels are like that, and are more akin to regular books. The Girls Beyond the Wasteland anime was adapted by Project Number 9, who outside this and also And You Thought There Was Never a Girl Online haven't done too much as of yet. The anime primarily follows Buntaro Hojo, a high school student with a talent for writing, but has no real direction in life or any plans for the future. That changes, however, when his classmate, Sayuki Kuroda, notices his talent, and decides to help him find a way to use his talent properly by enlisting him in her Bishoujo game development group, eventually known as Rokuhara. I mentioned it before, so what is a Bishoujo game? Bishoujo itself literally means pretty girl or beautiful girl, a Bishoujo game, also known as a gal game, is a type of Japanese video game centered on interactions with attractive girls and or women. It may take the form of something like a visual novel, but Bishoujo games can take multiple forms. However, they shouldn't be confused with Iroge, aka hentai games, or dating sims, although some Bishoujo games do contain erotic content. Now that you hopefully have a better idea on what type of game the characters in this anime are making, let's return to the topic at hand and my thoughts on Girls Beyond the Wasteland. Admittedly, up front, it's not great, especially since it starts off decent enough. The first two episodes do a pretty good job introducing and setting up all the roles for the characters. The main character Bunta even goes on a date with Kuroda in the very first episode, which considering this is something that you hardly ever see in any romance anime until the end, if you're lucky, I'm willing to praise Girls Beyond the Wasteland for it breaking typical romance genre tropes. Well, I would have had it not been for the last 10 episodes of the series. Yes, 10. That means after episode 2, the trouble starts. In episode 3, it's suddenly revealed to the audience that Yuka, Bunta's childhood friend, has feelings for him. It's rather odd since she's the one who pushed Bunta into going on a date with Kuroda in the first place. And if she did have feelings for him, you would think we would have seen something acknowledging it then. Putting the abrupt change in character aside, she goes through the rest of the anime not being able to convey her feelings to him, usually changing the subject at the last second. You know, typical romance anime stuff we've seen a hundred times before. Funny enough, Yuka is still probably the most interesting character in the anime, if only because of her backstory. By that I mean that she actually gets a backstory, because nobody else in the anime does. But while the romantic element is rather cliche and boring, the drama is not much better. In fact, I would say it's worse. Way worse. Simply because either A, the reason for the drama is rather petty, or B, when it's actually something major, the problem is quickly resolved, making it feel rather hollow and meaningless. Here are a couple of examples. 
again here in episode 3, Ando, the programmer, decides to quit for the first time. Yeah, she does it more than once. Because of lack of direction on the project, besides the point of their little training camp get-together being to help Bunta write so the project has a direction, it's all quickly wrapped up after Bunta convinces Ando to come back after he reminds her of all the fun she had talking with Kuroda. That seems logical, but this is actually the first time we as the audience have heard about this. Unless you want to count the brief segment in the opening animation. However, the audience shouldn't have to rely on the opening to understand the relationship between characters. An opening should emphasize characters' relationships, not define them. Then there's the big drama bomb, when it's revealed that Kuroda's reason for making a game was so that she could use the money they earned to pay off her brother's debt. And her getting everyone together as part of a school club was a way for her to get free labor. This causes everyone to quit except for her, but because they've been working on it for so long and put so much effort in it, they all decide to come back and finish the game. There's nothing wrong with that. I personally thought it was a rather noble thing of them to do. However, this huge dramatic moment where the majority of the characters are put into a tough position with conflicting feelings on how they should proceed is wrapped up in about 15 minutes. It's maybe a little more excusable had it been at the end of an episode, but it's not. It's the first half of the 11th episode, the second half of that episode being an overdramatic race against the clock to get the finished version of the game to the publisher in time. Girls Beyond the Wasteland is a drama romance, I won't dispute that, but its romance is cliche and boring, and its drama is petty and hollow. You may have noticed that I haven't talked too much about the game the characters were working on, and that's because while the audience is told they're working on a game, and we sometimes see an individual's progress on the game, we actually never see the collaborated progress on the game, nor the final product. The characters talk about the game, they talk about what's wrong with the game, we see people buy the game, but we never actually see the game. A video game is a very visual experience. Example, it's much more exciting to see Zelda Breath of the Wild in action than just being told Nintendo is working on a new Zelda game. So it's really hard to invest any interest in the game here in Girls Beyond the Wasteland, or what the characters are doing with it, when we're not shown any of it. Actually, I'm not even sure if they say the name of the game they're making. Let me check my notes. Uh, ah. Apparently the name of their game is called 24 Hours with Asamori-san. For the life of me, I have no idea when any of the characters said that. It must not have been a very memorable scene, much like the anime itself. Girls Beyond the Wasteland gets a bad in my arbitrary rating system. Once again because it told us what characters were doing and working on instead of showing us. And while it started off decent enough when setting up and establishing characters, as well as not conforming to standard tropes of the genre, it replaces all that by episode 3 with cliche romance tropes and near meaningless melodrama. For the next anime I'm covering, we need to jump back to the summer 2016 anime season, when ReZero was still airing, and was joined by other popular anime like Mob Psycho 100 and ReLife. No need to press any button to continue, because we're gonna go right ahead and start New Game. New Game is based on a Yonkoma manga. Yonkoma manga literally means 4 cell manga. It consists of 4 equal sized panels in a comic strip format usually ordered from top to bottom. The anime itself was adapted by Dogo Kobo, which I've mentioned in a previous video handled series like Girls Monthly no Zaki-kun, as well as the first two seasons of Yuro Yuri. They're also working on their currently airing Gabriel Dropout. And while New Game is mostly about video game development, it itself got a video game in the form of a visual novel developed by 5PD, who have made other visual novels like Love Love and Steins Gate. Focusing specifically on the anime, the main character, Alba Suzukaze, loves the fairy story game series, particularly the character designs, and is what led her into wanting to be a character designer. After graduating high school, she applies to Eagle Jump, the company responsible for making her favorite game, and is hired. On the first day, she's excited to learn that she'll be working on the latest installment of the fairy story series, Fairy Story 3. And even more exciting for Alba is she'll be working under lead character designer Ko Yagami, who was the character designer on the original fairy story. New Game very much is a workplace comedy with a dash of slice of life, which will take over the usual school setting, if only to break up the monotony of said setting. It also means that we get to see a girl right out of high school adjust to the workforce, meeting and working with new people, following company procedures, and dealing with mandatory overtime, to the point where it even affects her personal life, like when she gets into an argument with her best friend Nene because of all the fatigue and stress she's under. It has its fair share of comedic bits, and it's also at times just about cute girls doing cute things with just a hint of Yuri. Cute girls doing cute things and Yuri being two terms that are quite synonymous with each other nowadays. 
However, the aforementioned more serious stuff with Alba adjusting to the workplace is what I think makes New Game worthwhile, especially because of the relationship Alba forms with Ko. As the series progresses, we're subtly clued into both Alba's and Ko's past. We learn from Nene that before Alba accepted the position at Eagle Jump, she was debating whether she should accept it or go to the college she was accepted to. We obviously know what she chose, but it's something Ko did as well, work at Eagle Jump right out of high school. It's where we start to see some of the parallels between the two characters. Both have a passion for video games, and to a specific degree, character design. They both work incredibly hard and are always trying to improve their work. While they may be similar, they're still very different people. Ko has the ability to rub people the wrong way because of how strict she can be, while Alba can get along with almost anybody. And it's kind of cool to see how they affect each other. Alba will be inspired by Ko, then later Ko seeing Alba as a younger version of herself, to after that, Alba pushing Ko forward. One of the other nice things New Games does is show the progression of the game Alba and the others are working on. While a significant part of the game is already done the time Alba is hired, we see her learn the modeling software, we see her model the characters, we even see her go through the process of designing a character, we then see the characters in motion and then even play tested. We see the game in various states of production and we see the progress the characters make on it. New Game shows the audience the progress the characters make on the game individually and as a whole. The characters truly seem invested in their work and we as the audience are shown that, not just told. And ultimately it makes me feel more invested about the game and to these characters. To summarize, New Game is cute and fun, but occasionally depicts the struggles of a working adult. The characters' relationships are wonderful, especially Alba and Ko's, and maybe most importantly we're shown the characters working on the game and the progress they make on it, leading to this anime feeling like a worthwhile investment. New Game gets a good in my arbitrary rating system. Oh, and it was recently announced that it's getting a second season, so now is as good as time as any to get caught up. Moving on to the final anime I'm covering in this episode of Visor View, we only need to take a look back at the fall 2016 anime season, when Yuri on Ice was skating on top of other popular anime from that season, like Drifters and Keijo. However, way down on the popularity chart of the fall 2016 season rests Magic of Stella which on my anime list is right after my sleeper hit from the fall 2016 review, Scorching Ping Pong Girls, and right ahead of Vivid Strike. Quick side note, thank you Amazon for finally releasing Vivid Strike in the US, even if it is part of your new anime strike deal, and costs an additional $5 a month on top of an Amazon Prime subscription, but we're not here today to discuss an anime about girls performing magic-infused mixed martial arts. That's also tied to the Nanaha franchise. I'll save that for a different video, perhaps. Anyway, similar to New Game, Magic of Stella is based on a Yonkama manga. The anime was adapted by Silverlink, who have handled series like Nan Nan Biori, Fate Collide Liner Prisma Ilya, Tanaka Kun is Always Listless, and the currently airing Masamune Kun's Revenge. An interesting fact is that the series composition here in Magic of Stella was handled by Fumihiko Shimo, who held the same role on New Game. But series composition isn't the sole factor in creating an anime, so how does Magic of Stella compare? Let's find out. Magic of Stella follows Tamaki Honda. Upon enrolling in high school, she joins the Some Dead Fish Eyes, Not Enough Sun, Shuttle Run Club, or SNS Club for short. Their primary focus, to make doujin video games. If you're not familiar with doujin, it's a term used to refer to self-published works, including manga, novels, music, and video games. The club includes the club president and programmer, Shina, scenario writer, Ayame, and music composer, Kayo, with the previously mentioned Tama coming on board as an illustrator for the new game called, you guessed it, Magic of Stella though she's not the best artist. I'll start off by saying I didn't hate Magic of Stella. It does have some pretty good things. It shows us Tama trying to better her art throughout the series. I enjoy the running joke of her having some form of father complex. I also like how it depicts at times Sheena's struggling to be the president and leader of the club, as well as trying to be a good senpai for Tama. Then there's Minaha, who may not get a lot of character growth or progression, but I really like the influence she has on not just Tama, but also the club. Minaha comes in and spearheads the club's new game, Stardust and Tenzione, and I enjoyed watching a character's passion for a project pay off. Much like New Game, you'll find that Magic of Stella at times just features cute girls doing cute things. That is to say that the things the characters are up to don't pertain too much to the story, and are just doing something cute, which of course means a hint of Yuri baked in. It's something I don't personally mind, but there's don't pertain too much, and then there's going off on a complete tangent. The first half of the seventh episode is about a dumb, overly complex misunderstanding. Essentially, Kaya is working on some lyrics for a song and wants help from Tama. Tama interprets this as Kaya wanting help to confess her love to someone. One thing leads to another, and the joke eventually becomes that Tama thinks Kaya wants to have a baby with her. 
It's a series of events that doesn't tie into anything prior or later. It's just there as a joke that takes forever to set up and relies on near moronic levels of misunderstanding someone. In addition to the jokes not always landing, there's also the times where Magic Estella just feels sporadic. The 10th episode goes from new uniforms to the former club president Teru masquerading as a first year around school to Tama somehow upsetting Sheena because she wanted to keep improving her art, though I thought there were tears of joy at first because of the music cue. <laughs> anyway, then they make up, have some comedic Yuri moments, and then everyone shows up at Sheena's place to work on the game. It's hard to keep up with it at times, and that makes it not much fun to watch. Regarding the games being developed, Magic Estella, and then later Stardust and Tenzione, we don't see a lot of either of them. We are shown how the characters think that the story of Magic Estella should turn out, but as far as any actual footage of the games, we're left high and dry. Now we do see characters working on different aspects of the games, but we're usually just told how the progress as a whole is going. It's a little more engaging than Girls Beyond the Wasteland, but falls short when compared to how much we see of the game in New Game. To wrap Magic of Stella up, its jokes don't always land, and at times it can feel sporadic. It has some intriguing characters who slowly grow like Tama, and fun to watch characters like Minaha. It shows the concept of the story of one of the games in action, but we never see any gameplay footage or the game's progressions as a whole. Magic Estella gets an OK in my arbitrary rating system. There you have it. Three anime from 2016 that featured girls, girls, girls making video games, games, games. This video was mostly fueled by two of some of my favorite things, anime and video games. I'm sure it's not 100% accurate to the life of a video game developer, but no matter how I rated these anime, I enjoyed that they at least gave us a peek at that world. Thanks for watching this episode of Visor View. What are your thoughts on the anime I covered? And which was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. And remember, I'm your anime advisor, Anime Advisor, helping you figure out what anime you want to watch.